is I'm covering. And at the end of each section, I'll pause for a few moments in case you have questions. We thought it would be helpful to start with just an overview of key performance indicators that we look at throughout the year to monitor student achievement and school progress towards improvement goals. And the key indicators are proficiency and growth in mathematics and English as method measured through the state assessments as well as our local assessments. How well our, how well our schools are able to close achievement gaps and, and for our special education students to make progress as well as students within the response to intervention process. We also look at course enrollment and completion, graduation rates, post-secondary data such as college acceptance and enrollment after one year, as well as career readiness. And as usual, we look at attendance, discipline, susp and suspension data as well. So the overall goal is that we're monitoring our, our students and their progress to make sure they have access to the learning needed to graduate and be ready for college and careers. The next slide is just a reminder of our approach to assessment. It's a comprehensive uh, approach to assessment. So we're not just always looking at state assessment results. We're looking at several different in indicators to see that our students are proficient. The Rhode Island School Accountability System that was recently came out, and this is required under ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act, provides uh, a clear action provides clear, actionable information to families and community members about the district and the school performance. And if they answer the questions, how is the school doing and what support does the school need? This is an overview of the Rhode Island school performance measures. There are basically three buckets. The first bucket is academic performance. The second bucket is student success factors. And lastly, college and career readiness. And you can see there are different subcategories in there. This is an example of the rubric that they use in those areas. You should have a copy in front of you. I know it's difficult to see. Um, but basically, it breaks down those different areas that I just referenced. So it's um, performance pack factors um, in overall school performance and growth and reading and math. In addition, we are looking at proficiency, the proficiency level of our English language learners, the high school graduation rate, the ability of school to close the achievement gaps for particular subgroups, for the high school only graduation, points are based on all student performance, and Rhode Island's long-term goal of 95% of students graduating within four years. This is the star rating that they use for schools. It's a five-star system, five being the strongest performance in all indicators. Four, there's indication that the school is, has generally strong performance. Three would be some areas of weakness. Two, weaknesses at the overall school level. And one is the lowest performance in achievement, growth, or graduation. So in calculating the school's performance, once they determine the um, appropriate number of points, the rating is actually based on the area that has the lowest score. Next, we'll start to look at the school report cards that just came out, and this information is all on the Rhode Island Department of Education website. Colt Andrews received five stars in all areas except one. They were slightly below the achievement requirements in ELA and math. And I apologize. I meant to acknowledge the school administrators who were here. So if you do have a specific question about their school, they're happy to answer that. Rockwell received five stars in every category. So consistent with their strong performance in the past, they also do very well under this accountability system. <coughs> Gutierrez also received five stars. They've made significant gains in recent years due to the high level of collaboration and commitment of their teachers and Mrs. Sadler, the principal. 
principal in believing that all students can reach high levels of achievement. Although Terrace has a diverse student population, they have a number of English language learner students, um, students receiving special education services, and a high number of students who are elig eligible for free and reduced lunch, they've worked very hard to close the achievement gap, um, imp implementing the curriculum with fidelity, and um, continuously improving their instructional approaches to align math, excuse me, to align with the support that students need. some work to do. Um, they were very close in several areas um, in ensuring their instruction and expectations are uh, uh, to student learning are aligned to the rigor of the standards. They know that they're currently working on that. Teachers are engaged in initiatives including the foundations program in grades K through 2 and that is district wide. It's a fairly new program and working on small group personalized instruction based on student specific learning needs. This has been a focus of PD this year for K through two teachers, and in addition, they continue to support writing development through the Lucy Hawkins program. And again, that is in all schools, but I want to highlight the work that Nicole is doing. In math, the elementary math coaches are working with all of our schools on effective strategies for developing mastery of basic number facts, strategies for problem solving. And you call, like all our schools, is focused on continuous not quite where they'd like to be. They're not quite where they'd like to be, um, but they are working towards a lot of improvements. KMS is also working on improvement in a number of areas. In math, we've just implemented a new research-based program, and teachers are participating in ongoing professional development from consultants and Sarah Bogdan, the math curriculum leader at the middle school, to better align their instruction and classroom assessments to the content and rigor of the grade level standards. In ELA, they've also been working on improvements to their curriculum and working with other department leaders to promote reading and writing across <coughs> the curriculum. In both areas, they are heavily um, analyzing the RICAS data, the release items, and student work samples so that we can learn from Massachusetts and make sure that our instruction and assessment are aligned to the expectations state standards. Student absenteeism is a concern for KMS, but they have a number of initiatives in place that they began last year. One is an early warning system, so every two weeks they run a report to check attendance, and students who are below 90% in attendance, um, they receive a letter that's a letter sent home, the guy the school counselor is notified, and the assistant principal makes contact with the family. As needed, a truancy officer may also be involved. They also have a number of strategies in place to um, reduce their out-of-school suspensions. That was another area that they were low in. Um, and they have a part-time behavior specialist right now who's working closely with a number of students. They also have a refresh and reset program. So if a child is having difficulty staying in class, one of the administrators will come and take that student out, talk through the issue, and get them back into class as quickly as possible so they don't lose instructional time. They also have the peer mediation program that they recently began, as well as an in-school suspension room that's monitored by teachers. So all of these strategies are intended to keep the students in school and to uh, minimize the need for out-of-school suspension. And lastly, our high school received three stars. They have a great deal of work to do as well in reviewing their alignment to the instruction and assessment of, uh, to the PSAT and the SAT. In prior years, as you know, the high school did, was very successful in ELA on the park assessment. Now it's time for them to realign in their curriculum and instruction to the new assessments. The math department is also working on curriculum alignment and emphasis of timing of various topics so that we can get it right. In both math and ELA, they have also adapted their course offerings to include additional supports for students who are not yet meeting grade level expectations. And that's part of what you heard here this evening with the program of study. It's important to note that Mount Hope did make, um, meet the graduation requirement expectations. And we need to acknowledge that this is something that they've been working on for a number of years. So we're very happy to see that they met that criteria. Absolutely.
absentee is also a concern at the high school, but they have a number of strategies in place. They have a school-wide competition on attendance between grades. They have a truancy program and personalized learning plans for students with social-emotional challenges. They also have early interventions for students and families during the first quarter, and they continue to strengthen culture and climate. So all in all, they have those strategies in place, and I'm sure that they were very successful with their tardiness rate, and I know that they can do it with absenteeism. For out-of-school suspensions, they're examining the current code of conduct. They're better use of utilizing the current high school programs that they have, such as extended day and personalized learning plans. Also, they're continuing to support students and target root causes of behavior. Mount Hope also continues to develop and implement a multi-tiered system of support to close achievement gaps and ensure students are on track for graduation and able to successfully meet the graduation requirements. So that is all of the school report cards. Does, do any of you have particular questions on any of the schools or on their report cards? Uh, we are. Social workers, psychiatrists. 
Yes, yeah, so, uh, our school is psychology works with lots of students, social workers. So, so anybody that's suspended gets to speak, see the social worker or the, or the uh, psychologist? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily? Like, I mean, like, they don't have a standing uh, appointment with the first base. I mean, we, as a team, we work together, our whole guiding suite and myself works together very closely with the students. And so I think that, like, when someone gets suspended for some, for, you know, unfortunately, when someone gets suspended, um, like I said, when they're welcomed back to the community, in the community, we all work in them to, like, repair and restore that relationship with the larger community itself. Don't you think that child has a, has a problem that needs to be addressed? They do, and that's what I'm saying. We, we're holistically. By a professional, I'm talking. I'm not talking about you or a principal or a, anyone else. I'm talking about a, a professional who should talk to this student who definitely has a problem. Yes, and we are. Uh, we always work with the families and try to get as much uh, outside support as possible as well. But can I? Can I just please? Are you talking about Mr. Corral in every situation where there's a suspension? Because I. I'm, I don't, is it warranted in every situation that a student meets with a social worker or a school psych psychologist? Well, it depends on what you think of uh, warrants or suspension. Well, I, I, I guess I would more ask uh, the people in that job myself, but I'm, it, I'm, I'm wondering if what you're asking, uh, when we're asking them, if, if, if this happens in every situation, I would, I would like to know, is it warranted in every situation? Um, I, there are some students who have significant challenges and need, and like I said, we are trying our best to work with those students to uh, meet those needs and in, in, in just needs. Going on with Eric, sorry. Um, what, what decision, what makes your decision as to bring in professional help? Let me ask you that. That's what I'm thinking. Um, like I said, the professional help is an ongoing professional help, and so, um, like I said, depending on the incident, so there are some students who uh, the suspension because they have more than others, and those students, they like said, we are working with those students, and we have uh, part time behavior specialists that comes in, we work with those students as well. Um, and so there are multi layers um, to the supports that those students get. Let me go in a different direction for you, okay? <clears throat> I've had a lot of contact with people who have children who kick me off. Apparently, I, it could not be, might not be true. There's a bullying situation that's going on. Okay. My opinion is, if a bully is bullying, he has problems and he needs help. It's not in a suspension. It's not going to help him. You put him in a suspension room. He goes to what it is. He comes out. He still got the same problem. And he's going to do the same thing. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but I mean, many people in these communities are concerned about the bullying at your school. And I, I have a granddaughter at that school, and believe me, I'm concerned about it. All right? So I want to know that something is being done. I know that the, the, the victim has, has uh, the people take care of them or whatever, but the bully needs help. It's my problem. So if I could just address that. Uh, this year, KMS, we were actually, Matt and I were on the phone today, we were partnering with the Center for Mediation and Resolution of uh, Rhode Island. So Judge Hurst is a reference, and we work with her. So we agree with you. I think it's more, we're not going to stop bullying by a detention or a suspension, but it's at the root cause. So Matt has been, uh, Mr. Yates has been part of the uh, four teachers and about 15, 12 to 15 students um, working with the center on how do we find a root cause so that we can address that issue. So um, the center will be coming in. One community um, um, workshop already. There'll be a second community workshop that will be on February 13th on how do we, when the students and give those tools and the students as bystanders or when they see that so we can combat combat bullying. So I agree with you that it's more than um, just suspending a student for a day, but what's the root cause? And, and it's, it's through our training. It's what's the conflict that's actually causing the action of, of the behavior that's bullying. Once you can get that initial conflict to resolve that, then the bullying should subside in a way. So that's a lot of the conversation. So I think we are just for clarification on the suspension. Um, we do not want to suspend our students as much as possible. Um, but if they get into a, a fight, verbal altercation, if the 
here, um, disrespecting our, our adults by swearing at them and being disruptive in that regard, it's a whole different level of what does that suspension look like? And, um, both at the middle school and high school, we try to take multiple steps before we have to get to the suspension. But as Mr. Yates um, indicated, when the student moves back, how do we resolve that? Whether it's through restorative practices um, and trying to meet with the teachers you know, so that we can move forward. But if I agree with Bullion, it's more than just saying you have a detention or you have a, a suspension because that's not going to stop it. You need to get at the root cause of what is that conflict. In my opinion, the bully, the bully is really something. Thank you. 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 I mean, it's, it's a problem. So the problem is simple. Again, this information now, this is 2017, 2018 information. You're, you're already halfway through the school year. As educational leaders, you have information and you start action planning, making decisions. You gotta look at time and resources, and you try to solve the problem. It doesn't mean you solve it the first time, and then you gotta go back to the recess. So with that said, is there anything we can do to, uh, I know this information came out what, last month, Dr. Andrea. Is there anything to expedite it next year? Is Ryan looking to do that quicker? And then my question, and I don't need an answer right now, but I'm looking at, especially the three schools um, that are maybe struggling a little bit here, um, and that doesn't come up to us directly per se, or through Kind of what resources do you need? I mean, Mr. Cabral and Stan, I think that's not good. But I would ask you, and I, again, I don't need an answer now, but definitely push it up the chain, per se. What can we do to assist you to try to help correct you quicker? And the other question is, is that right? I don't know if you have that. Yeah, I can respond to both of your questions. So this year being the first year for the broadcast assessment, longer because they had to go through the standard setting process and um, next year we're told that in August we will receive a preliminary file of our students um, progress and then by the end of September we will have all of this documentation uh, and I believe the accountability reports will come out next October. So the first year of the brand new test is always much slower so that they can get all of those pieces in place. Um, regarding the supports that schools need within our budget process this year, we're taking a different approach. We're asking schools to evaluate the needs of their students, their assessment results, all of the data that they have regarding their students' success and needs, and then develop improvement goals. So when we bring the budget work 